Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, uh, Colombo Metropolitan Rotary. Um, I think what I'm going to give you or try to give you today is a countervailing perspective, a counter perspective to uh, the perspective on the elections that is dominant in uh, Colombo, in our social circles. Now, I think a counter perspective is, is necessary because the track record shows that uh, those of us who are born and bred in Colombo tend to have a certain blind spot in our socio-political perceptions and that blind spot has led on uh, several significant occasions to uh, erroneous political assumptions and conclusions. I'll get to that uh, as I go along, but uh, let me just say very schematically that uh, the citizens, especially the upper middle class citizens of Colombo, tend to confuse a niche market for a mass market. And that is really the source of many of the errors of perception that uh, one is able to notice when you look back on the political prognostications made in this town over uh, several decades. Now, coming to August 17th, 2015, I would like to offer a few thoughts, not as uh, uh, ideas that I think are uh, the uh, only ones around uh, or even uh, totally accurate but as a perspective they happen to be a personal perspective uh, of somebody who also happens to be a, a student and teacher of politics and a commentator on political affairs but that's all they are they're just uh, a point of view now What's the most important single thing about the upcoming elections? What are these elections about? The election of August 2015 takes place in a new constitutional context. It is in the post 19th amendment context, which means that the designation of Prime Minister is far more important than it has been since 1978. So, the Daily Mirror was correct when, uh, last morning I believe it was, it had this headline uh, which said RW versus MR, uh, the Premier Stakes I believe it was. Uh, the race for the Prime Ministership or something of that sort, illustrated uh, with a very striking uh, cartoon of uh, a gunfight of uh, Mr. Vikramasinghe and Mr. Rajapaksa uh, hitting the, the street in kind of a high noonish uh, scenario. Now I think the Daily Mirror got it right and whatever else this election may be about, good governance, uh, corruption, etc uh, etc et and uh, despite the signals by President Sirisena in his uh, important speech yesterday this election remains quintessentially about the choice of Prime Minister that's what it's about that's the race and our young friend uh, Mr. Sajid Premadasa, Deputy Leader of the United National Party, confirmed this in his speech on the 11th of July at Campbell Park, which was the kickoff rally of the United National Front, Good Governance Front's campaign, um, in which he said, This is uh, about making Mr. Vikramasinghe the Prime Minister. This race will end, he said, with Mr. Vikramasinghe becoming the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. So that's what it's about. 
And that is indeed the way in which the electorate is going to understand this election. So, post 19th Amendment, empowered prime ministership, uh, a prime ministership somewhere between uh, the prime ministership of 47 77 and post 78. So, more empowered than anything since 78 less so than the Westminster model. The second thing about the election is that it's being held at this time because there were two scenarios one on uh, the part of the United National Party and contained in the uh, presidential election manifesto the 100 day plan which was for election for the dissolution of parliament on the 23rd of April this year. Now that did not or could not take place. The other scenario was the one that was mooted by uh, the advisors of and, and the supporters of President Sirisena. Namely that uh, the 20th amendment would also be seen through and that election would be held uh, towards the far end of this year, perhaps even early next year, since the parliament could go on till the 23rd, uh, till uh, April of 2016. The thinking behind the UNP's uh, fast track uh, election slogan was that uh, it could capitalize on uh, uh, incumbency, on, on being in office, and that it would face a divided Sri Lanka Freedom Party. The thinking on the part of President Sirisena's loyalists was that the longer it took, the less influential would the former President Rajapaksa become, and power would uh, inevitably shift uh, in, within the Sri Lanka Freedom Party to those who supported President Sirisena, who, uh, after all, did wield executive power, even after the 19th Amendment. Now, neither of these scenarios came about. Instead, you have an election uh, smack dab in the middle of the year. And the reason, as President Sarasena disclosed last evening, was that uh, the opposition had a, a, a revolver aimed at the head of the Prime Minister. And President Sarasena pretty much claimed that he bailed out Prime Minister Vikram Singh by dissolving Parliament before the no confidence motion could be debated, leading to, in President Sirisena's own disclosure, uh, an SLFP government in which Mahindra Rajapaksa would be the head. Now, the third most significant thing about uh, the election, I would submit, is the rapidity of the comeback made by the former President Rajapaksa. And uh, here, I think we have to bear uh, a few things in mind. It is usually the case that when uh, the General Secretary of our party defects, then becomes the President, he constitutes a natural pole of gravity and therefore influence drains away from the previous and defeated leader to the new one, especially when he has taken over the party. Now, it can be argued that uh, President Sirisena is a relatively mild-mannered man who lacks charisma and therefore this was difficult to do. But this uh, begs the question of why uh, former President Kumaratunga, whose family founded the Sri Lanka Freedom Party and who had played an active role in the, the events of January 8th, was unable to support President Sirisena adequately so as to win over the bulk of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. Because that was indeed the game plan. And if you go back six months and read the political columns in the newspapers and the websites, <coughs> excuse me, you would uh, find that the expectation was that Mahindra Rajapaksa would either stay home or if he did make a comeback, he would be 
uh, I believe the phrase was a marginal cult figure of uh, the Sinhalese ultra-nationalists. The Sri Lanka Freedom Party uh, would uh, splinter, it was assumed, with the smaller part going along with Mahinda Rajapaksa. Now, that didn't work out too well. And as President Sirisena's address to the nation yesterday disclosed, 99% of uh, SLFP representatives, uh, he said, were for uh, the uh, granting of nomination to Mahindra Rajapaksa. Uh, and of course, so were all the leaders of the UPFA. Now, why would that be the case? On the one hand, you have uh, a 45-year-old veteran, or rather veteran of 45 years of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, uh, Maitri Palasiri Sena, uh, General Secretary for 10 years, uh, as, assuming the presidency and uh, only six months into office. One would assume that the pulling power was quite great and he was backstopped by uh, former President Chandrika Banarayak Kumartung who has decades, who has inherited a decades long influence within the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. Why was this duo unable to do as they planned and either freeze Mahindra Rajapaksa out or limit him to a rather narrow uh, support base within the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. Now, the answer is the marketplace. Obviously, the bulk, the overwhelming bulk, 99% is President Sirisena's uh, term, the, the overwhelming bulk of Sri Lanka Freedom Party elected representatives felt that the ground had shifted under their feet. That there was a tremendous social demand for Mahinda Rajapaksa, which for reasons of their own electoral survival impelled them to seek his reinduction and to associate themselves with him. Basically, they were piggybacking on Mahindra Rajapaksa, which tells me that there was a groundswell. A groundswell which outweighed the combined influence of President Sirisena being in office and former President Kumar Tunga supporting him and, and taking a stridently uh, critical stance on Mahindra Rajapaksa. We do know that there were some embarrassing incidents at the meetings of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party uh, where she was heckled uh, while President Sirisena was in the, in the chair. So these are the three most striking things about the election itself. That it's about the Prime Ministership, that it's taking place at the time it is, and that there's been a, a very rapid comeback, uh, 0 to 60 miles per hour in whatever seconds, uh, five, six month comeback by Mahindra Rajapaksa. So I, I urge you to, to bear those in mind. Now, I began my remarks, which won't go on for very much longer, I assure you, uh, by talking about the blind spot of uh, us, if I may say so, as a collective. Now, one of the surprises about the election of 1956 was that it was so big a surprise, so large a surprise, so big a shock uh, to the English-speaking uh, classes of Ceylon. Why was that? That is because we tend to live in a social echo chamber. Our interface with uh, those outside the citadel is in the form of uh, well-meaning and quite uh, imperative uh, efforts at charity and social upliftment. But there's no real, there's never been a real dialogue outside uh, what I call the walls of the citadel. It was only uh, Denzel Pires, the legendary editor who uh, went on to distinguish himself internationally 
uh, who wrote a book about 1956, uh, just after that. He, he was very sensitive to what was going on in 56. But the readers, and this is my point here, the readers of the English language press in Ceylon at the time, that is the readers of the Lake House Press and the Times uh, of Ceylon, were completely out of touch with the social currents that were swirling around them in uh, the heartland of the island. Now, of course, I wasn't even born uh, during the election of 56. I was born at the tail end of that year. And in that sense, I am a, a child of 56. But I do remember very vividly the elections of 1970 when the same thing happened all over again. And uh, I used to tag along with my dad, uh, Mervyn De Silva, the journalist and editor, uh, for political meetings when I was uh, in short pants. And I do remember him uh, uh, doing a sort of coloring a map at home. And he took this map and he went up to his chairman Ranjit Vijayawadana, chairman of Lake House, who was also a classmate of my father's younger brother at St. Thomas's. Uh, and, and said, Ranjit, look, uh, I'm telling you, the UNP is going to lose. And Mr. Jordan, who is a very charming and very intelligent man, whom I like very much, uh, said, but Mervyn, that's completely contrary to what everybody else is telling me. And my father said, look, I've been out there, and these are the figures, these are my, this is my guesstimate. And of course, he turned out to be right. Uh, what was ironic was that in 1967, uh, my father had written a three-part piece, full, three, full pages in the Ceylon Observer, um, predicting precisely this. Looking back at 56, talking about how the elite got it wrong, and looking forward to the, the coming elections three years down the road, and predicting the result that ensued in 1970. So it was not unpredictable. It is just that Colombo was blinkered. It had a blind spot. And I would urge that we examine ourselves over the next few weeks and wonder whether we still have that blind spot. That blind spot uh, is constituted by the idea that of the two parties or two formations or two candidates, surely, surely the masses must support the one who is most like us, though we may not particularly like him or her. And uh, that is where it starts to go wrong. Now, coming back to uh, this election, I think we need to revisit the result of January 8th itself. When you do that, when you look at the electoral map of January 9th, you would see that the tipping point, as empirically demonstrable, was in uh, the northeast and the hill country, uh, city of Colombo, of course. And that's where the difference between victory and defeat for uh, the, the coalition, the swan, was located, was lodged. Now, at this election, those areas will be voting for their own ethno-regional or ethno-linguistic parties. So in that sense, they are out of the immediate game, but they would come back only post-election in the formation of a coalition. But the, the playing field, or if you want to be a little more martial, the gladiatorial arena would be that part of the island in which the SLFP, or may I say Mahindra Rajapaksa, actually won even when he lost. So the fight between the UNF or UNGGF, led by Prime Minister Vikramasinghe, and the Sri Lanka Freedom Party slash UPFA, led by all intents and purposes, Mahindra Rajapaksa, uh, 
will take place in a battlefield in which Rajapaksa won even when he lost. That is the two-thirds of the island, the, the, the so-called cultural heartland. Now, what has happened since then? Theoretically, there should have been a shift away from Rajapaksa to the incumbent administration. It's far too early for anti-incumbency to have set in. But I wonder, I wonder because of the economic performance. There has not been a sense of uh, uh, hitting the ground running, which is usually the case when there is a UNP government. Perhaps this was because the, the UNP government of 2015 was not really elected to office and was a minority government. Now, that having been the case, it was incumbent upon that administration to strive for consensus, to avoid unilateralism, to avoid polarization, to uh, co-op the SLFP, to build bridges. But that is not what took place. You had a, a policy of lashing out in all directions, accompanied by a conspicuous drop in the developmental drive. And now that's a strong point of the UNP traditionally, economics. But that strength was not in evidence during the six months in office. In fact, you had a very strange situation of a creeping contrast with uh, what was perceived as the developmental dynamism of the previous administration, warts and all. And then of course there is the perception of uh, minoritarianism, of, of having cut the Northern Provincial Council far too much slack with its genocide resolutions and so on and so forth. That's another sensitive area. So I would say that you start with an election result of January 8th in which Rajapaksa won in the southern two-thirds of the island even when he lost in the island overall. You have an election looming in, on the 17th of August in which the battleground between the UNP and the SLFP will be those areas and you have um, a performance in six months which doesn't lead me to think that there's been a change from the January 8th result in the relevant battlefield. Uh, to put it very schematically, Prime Minister Vikramasinghe is facing Mahindra Rajapaksa on the latter's home turf at this election. Home turf being where he won even when he lost the presidency. The assumption was that that would change, not necessarily because the UNP would become uh, drastically more popular, but because the SLFP would split. That I believe is why the UNP did not cultivate uh, the electorate. It didn't, it, it didn't go at a slower pace, build more consensus, uh, and uh, instead have this rather arrogant unilateralism. If the UNP did not expect that the SLP would stay together, or rather, if it didn't expect a split, I think uh, even the the bond issue might not have taken place. But there was a cavalier attitude that you know, we don't really have to care. Rajapaksa will not be given nomination. Uh, he won't risk Namal's career, and uh, or he'll be locked up. Homeland Security is here to help us. Um, he'll be out of the running and even if he's in the running the Sri Lanka Freedom Party will split. Now all of that was proven wrong. You therefore have a polarized situation. Now finally we come to the choice. 
the choice, and here I'm not going to indicate any preference, and might I use the opportunity of saying that contrary to the newspaper reports, I'm not on the UPFA national list. Um, in terms of the choice, I wish to draw your attention that it's a far more polarized and polarizing choice than we have seen for a very, very long time. Unless, of course, you're thinking of 10 years ago, where you had exactly the same choice to make in 2005. But if you look back at our elections, look at, for instance, 1988. I mean, <laughs> there wasn't a, a world of difference between Rana Singha Premadasa and Sirima Obanaranaika. They were both, broadly speaking, moderate nationalists, populists of some sort. Then let's move on to 1994. There wasn't a world of difference between Chandrika Maranayak Kumaratunga and Gamani Disanayaka who was the candidate until the Tigers killed him. And then there wasn't that much difference except in, in obvious political terms, but socially uh, there wasn't that much difference between uh, Madam uh, Srimad Disanayaka and Chandrika Kumaratunga. But this time, as in 2005, you have a very stark choice between Prime Minister Vikram Singh and former President Rajapaksa. These are polar opposites. These are antipodes. Not just in where they're coming from, uh, but also what they stand for, their values. Now, this polarization makes me a little uncomfortable because such polarization means that the election is also polarizing. I was very unhappy that President Sirisana made the speech yesterday, not because I think he's going to take votes away from Mahindra Rajapaksa, but because I would have preferred uh, a buffer in a polarized situation. Instead, there seemed to be a kind of a zigzagging movement uh, from uh, granting nomination to Rajapaksa, then criticizing him and so on. So when there is a zigzag on the part of uh, the, the person who should be the referee, then that lends to the polarization. You don't have uh, a buffer zone, really. So, I think this is going to be a very polarizing election. Uh, when it comes to the choice of prime ministership, well, just think about it. It's a job. And uh, when it's a job, you tend to look at the CV and uh, the voters will look at the CVs in terms of actual performance. We've had this fight once before in 2005, exactly 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago. And Rajapaksa won, Rani lost. Now, what has happened in the intervening decade? We have to ask ourselves whether Mr. Vikram Singh's stature has grown sufficiently over the last 10 years to match or dwarf the growth in stature of Mahindra Rajapaksa who when he ran in 2005 was uh, uh, had, had just been very briefly a Prime Minister and as in the current case it was well known that his own party leader uh, President uh, Kumar Tunga at that time was tilting in favor of Ranel. So I think the situation in which he finds himself today is uh, not entirely unfamiliar to him. But when you look at the two persons to whom you're going to give this job, you also have to remember, okay, these guys, I've seen these guys before, 10 years ago they were both here, we chose one over the other, and um, what have they been doing in the last 10 years? Uh, when you look at the track record, I am not convinced that uh, uh, Prime Minister Vikram Singer will be able to avoid the result of 2005. He did try to avoid it in 2010 and 2015 with very good reason. He ducked a, a confrontation with Mahindra Rajapaks. Now he thinks he's ready for it. Uh, so we have uh, a replay of 2005 with the events of the intervening decade. And will the voters weigh those events and find that Rajapaksa's demerits outweigh his merits or would they think that his merits outweigh his demerits? And what would they think of Prime Minister Vikram Singer? 
Again, uh, it's a question of whether they think his merits outweigh his demerits or vice versa. And then they will choose between these two. Because it is as was the Indian election, though that didn't have a residual executive presidency, uh, the Indian election the last time was known as quasi-presidential. It, it was to do with, with Modi. So that's our situation today. And uh, I, I, would, I would say that uh, it is important for uh, those of us who uh, are uh, relatively more globalized uh, and uh, who, who have this metropolitan background to be aware of the possible deficits in our own perceptions and prepare ourselves for possible uh, electoral surprises come August 18th. Thank you.